Hello and welcome to the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2021. Now, tonight we have something a little different for you. No one can ignore the fact that the biggest story by far facing all of us is climate change. And this is true here at Chelsea as much as anywhere else. It's a huge subject and at times seems quite overwhelming. So we're going to devote a whole programme to this pressing issue and show you some of the practical solutions we can all do at home to make a difference. Our team of gardening experts have been exploring the showground to find inspiration that is relevant to all of us. Well, I best get cracking then, Monty, as there's lots to discuss. Coming up tonight from the RHS Chelsea Flower Show, an event supported by M&G. Juliet Sargent is delving into the world of wildlife gardening, looking for ideas that will help bugs, bees and birds in the coming autumn season and beyond. Carol Klein heads to the pavilion to prove that hardy, resilient plants do not have to be uninspiring. And journalist and author Alistair Campbell tells us why in recent years he's turned his back on politics and unleashed his inner eco-warrior. Joe and I are in the COP26 now, which the RHS has done to give us inspiration, instruction, explanation. Well, yes, I think it's sort of where we are and where we, where we could be going yeah. with climate change in our garden. So, over here, we've got something uh, well, the, you wouldn't normally see at Chelsea, Monty. No, uh, it's pretty dramatic and, and clearly it's showing. We've got plastic, we've got concrete, we've got metal, yeah. stagnant water. Yeah, it's stuff that we're throwing in our gardens and using them as a bit of a rubbish dump. I mean, there's a few plants over there. OK, this, this is the worst case scenario. Yeah, that's then, the worst of the worst. Then it starts to get positive. Yes, it does. OK, so over on this quarter... Yeah, the, this section, well, it's called adaptation, and it's not. It's about plants that have adapted, you know, to, to suit certain climates, but it's also how we can adapt to grow yeah. different plants. And a lot of these plants we're familiar with anyway. They're not like a whole new palette of plants. No, although certainly on a wet garden like mine, what I like is, is the way that you can raise up you know, we talk about raised beds, but actually you can make it look really good. Yeah. Raise the plants up so their roots don't sit in the roots. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's about drainage and um, some of them are a little bit tender as well. And I guess it, it, if things do heat up, we'll be able to, well, grow more tender plants. But I think also what this is beginning to show, that, that gardeners have to react. We're on the front line. We have to adapt to what's actually happening rather than what is prescribed elsewhere. Now, the third area is, I think, called mitigation. Mitigation, yes. Yeah. This is how we can deal with our plot, what's on our plot. We can, we can garden more organically. And you know, you, the most important thing is knowing your yeah. soil as I mean, well. That's where you start. I mean, you've got chalk there and heavy clay here. Yeah. A lot of the plants that will thrive in chalk are not going to grow well in here, so don't try. No, but also whatever type of soil you've yeah. got. Composting, you know, you're the compost legend, aren't you, Monty? That's not quite big enough for you, but no, it no. illustrates... It's the beginning and it's the right idea. And yes. I like the way we've got, you know, wildflower meadows, we've got water, we've got long grass, we've got shrubs, trees. Yeah, we've got water. So yeah. you know, rather than stagnant water, we've got a pool here, yeah. water's moving through it. We're dealing with the water that lands on our plot. So the point about this, these are all active measures that any garden can take yeah. to improve the situation, bring in wildlife. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. we've also got cover, we've got trees, yeah. which is important, very important. I mean, the thing is, okay, that, that's fine. There's a lot of do-goodery here. I know a lot of people feel, well, fine, but I, in the end, all I just want is a nice car. But the thing is, you don't have... Yeah. People, uh, it's not like you have to start now. It's just a yeah. case of being yeah. able to, yeah. to move forward with our gardens, and we might have to change things, we might have to yeah. adapt. This one's called Balance. It's, yeah. got, it's got lots of uh, ornamentals, it's got lots of edibles mm. in. We've got short clip grass, longer clip grass. We've and got plants in pots. I mean, you, yeah. there's a big citrus in a pot. Huge yes. citrus in a pot as well. But it's just that we might have to slowly adapt what we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my big thing is that everybody can do something. And what's interesting about this is that includes the people who don't have gardens. Because, you know, six million people don't have gardens. Uh, vast majority do, but even if you don't have a garden, these are the biggest window boxes uh, on Earth. I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but they, they illustrate again that you know you can grow in containers, you can go on window sills, window yeah. boxes. You know, uh, community gardens are coming together. Any, everyone can get together and grow but something. The, well, something, but it's really important what you grow. These are all pollinating plants. Grow something to attract pollinators. And, and what I really like about this is, is climate change is not something happening out there. It's happening at home. 
to me, to you, to all of us. And it is a bit daunting and it can seem complicated, but it's something that we will be exploring uh, throughout the show tonight. Well, Carol's been to the pavilion to take a look at the plants that will thrive in these tough conditions while still adding plenty to your borders. Climate scientists tell us that our summers are going to get hotter and drier. And of course, lots of us already have to cope with exactly those conditions. All plants everywhere have evolved along with their circumstances. So some plants can cope with real deep shade, some with very moist conditions, and a whole range of plants with extremely dry conditions. And they have all sorts of devices for actually making sure that they can not only survive, but they can thrive too. Here on this gorgeous garden, there's a prostrate rosemary that just tumbles over the top of these boxes. It's got fine needle-like leaves and it doesn't lose any moisture at all, even on a hot sunny day like this. Not all of us have big gardens. Some of us don't have gardens at all. And we've got to garden perhaps in containers, in window boxes, even in hanging baskets. Well, a lot of these plants are actually made for those sorts of growing conditions. So plants like this Echeveria frosty has two devices to withstand really dry conditions. It has succulent leaves which act as reservoirs, but also its leaf surface is covered in tiny little hairs which actually repel the sun and protect the cuticle of the leaf. There are a few plants that are bulbs or tubers that can stand it hot and dry. In fact, they revel in it. This is one of them, this dainty little rhodo hypoxis. When things turn cold and perhaps wet, the whole plant will die back into its tubers and wait for the next time it can spring up again. Just look at these sempervivums growing in the colander. You can grow them in an inch or two of soil or even between the tiles on your roof. They'll survive. Sempervivum means always living. They're impossible to kill. And it'd be pretty difficult to get rid of this too. This is Eryngium planum. It's a European sea holly. grows high up in the mountains in stony dry soil. And it puts a great big taproot down into the ground and gathers up any available moisture. But this, has to be my favourite of all. This is Haberanthus mansesii. It's called the rain lily. It's over the summer, it's hiding under the soil. It's a little bulb. But when it rains in the autumn, up it comes and displays these beautiful flowers. Isn't nature wonderful? It's not just dry conditions we need to think about. Chances are we're going to get extremely wet too. Already this year, some of us have experienced localised and heavy flooding. So how can we get our gardens to be wet weather ready? Rachel's been to investigate. There's no question that water in a garden looks beautiful, and sounds wonderful. But it's equally important, particularly when we're concerned about lack of rainfall and at the other extreme, flooding. We need to think carefully about how to manage it in our gardens. We all have areas of hard landscaping in our gardens, whether it's the driveway or the patio in the back garden. Unfortunately, many of them are absolutely non-porous and we slap down concrete or paving stones without thinking about the water running off and just simply being lost. And so there are alternatives. Obviously, grass is a lovely surface underfoot, but not great to park the car on. Gravels and things like bark. But if you need something a bit more sturdy, this is a really good idea. You've got gravel here, but it's bound together with resin and yet it remains porous. You can see here the water just runs through this surface, which is rock hard, 
comes down through the stones and it's collected in a reservoir which is all hidden beneath the ground. And then that can run underneath any planting areas nearby. And what happens is there's a wick under here and that draws the water up into the growing medium. And that means strong, healthy plants. I think it works extremely well, whether it's flooding you're trying to avoid or irrigation, saving every bit of that precious rainwater. Why have an ordinary tiled roof when you can have a green roof? Now, sedums are very popular on roofs. This one's also got a juga, it's got some provivum. I can see a bit of ivy up there. And they not only look good, but they're doing a great job because they are slowing the process by which any rainwater meets the ground. And so these plants obviously all benefit from the water themselves. And what I also love is that any overflow comes then onto this drain pipe. I love that it's transparent so you can see if there are any leaves collecting there, any blockages developing. And it goes down here into the water butt and the water inside there that gets stored can be used to irrigate all the planting. And as a bonus, because there are those solar panels up there, the power from them pumps the water back up and creates this lovely water feature here on the inside of the walls. I think it looks good, it's doing a great job, and most importantly, not a drop of water gets wasted. Now, when it comes to gardening, the truth is there are plenty of simple choices out there that can make a big difference, even on a small scale. But there is one thing we can all do, whatever our gardens are like, that has the potential to change things on a much bigger scale, and that is planting trees. Earlier in the summer, we caught up with David Dodd, the designer of the Queen's Green Canopy Garden, to discover why his design is an environmental call to arms. My name's David Dodd. I've built over 20 RHS show gardens, and this is the first one I've designed. The name of the garden is the Queen's Green Canopy. The loss of any woodland or forestation is tragic. What we can all do is get out there and start planting more trees on any scale. This is part of the ethos behind the Queen's Green Canopy. Hartwood Forest is a great example and, and represents very much what the garden's going to be about in the sense that we've got the ancient woodland and there's also woven into the landscape new forestation and new woodland areas. I'm meeting Toby Bancroft from the Woodland Trust. Ancient woodlands are a combination of centuries of the relationship between the soil, the climate, the species that live here, the trees that grow here. They just can't be replaced. This is one of the richest habitats in the UK and we need to be thinking about the land in between those ancient woodlands. Connecting them up allows different species to move through it. That's so important for their future survival. Yeah. So David, we've come from the ancient woodland. I brought you into this newly planted area. The community have really been engaged with this project and have helped us plant it. The Queen's Green Canopy is an initiative to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And what better way to mark that than to plant a tree, either in your garden or in a window box, or planting a big wood like Hartwood. Yeah. Um, it'd be fantastic. It'd be lovely to have this space as a back garden though, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've always thought of trees as a piece of living art or sculpture and that's how they should be treated within any design. The garden is a tapestry of habitat from the poor, biodiverse, lowly and perennial ryegrass, which is agricultural ground, and then that goes into wildflower and then the wildflower goes into the canopy of the trees under which there's going to be ornamental woodland planting and the proportions of each area is where we want to be heading towards within the British landscape. When I was asked to design the triangle, it was slightly daunting because it's an O-dig site and we have trees, they're all averaging about six metres tall and we would want to dig down slightly, but we're not allowed to. So it's going to be very sort of touch and go.
Hartwood Forest was an amazing place to visit, but here we are at Majestic Trees to select the trees for the Chelsea Flower Show. Oh wow, these are looking wonderful. Yeah, these, these are the silver birch we've chosen and these are a multi-stem tree. It's the only multi-stem tree we're using in the garden and they're just gonna add more body and, and a sort of slight change in, in form. These are the Acer Campestri field maples. Unfortunately, the weather hasn't been kind, so they're not going to be show garden ready for this September. These are the alternative field maples which we've found. It's Acer Campestri Elegant. They're fantastic trees much fuller crown to them and they're going to add more drama to the garden. So if you're inspired to go and plant a tree, there should be a species suitable for any condition. What better way to celebrate the Queen's Green Canopy than planting a small tree like this Malus Royal Beauty? Stunning foliage going from green turning red in the summer. It's the perfect tree for any small garden. I'm really happy with the trees we've selected for the Chelsea Flower Show and I'm even happier to know that after the show they're going to be transported up to RHS Bridgewater in Manchester where they're going to be planted as part of their development for a new woodland area. The Queen's Canopy exhibit garden by the RHS really focuses on how important trees are not just to climate change, but also to gardeners and how we can use them. And the project is that we all plant a tree and they will connect. And they don't just connect physically, but also the way that they introduce wildlife and connect us to the incredible power of trees in terms of climate change and wildlife. And as gardeners, growing a tree might seem a bit daunting, but actually it's fascinating. You plant this small tree, and from the minute you plant it, there is a magic in the way it grows. I mean, planting an oak tree, for example, might seem an extraordinary thing to do, but it's amazing. I planted one at Longmeadow, and now it's about 20 foot tall, and I almost go and visit it as an old friend. And underplanting, you have here, you have thalictrums, you have Japanese anemones, you've got hostas. Woodland planting is a really rich, diverse thing. So if you put one tree in your garden, you can create a border around it. Birch grows really well and quickly. Oak, beech. Don't plant ash because there are real problems with disease with that. But any of our native trees will settle and establish. And your garden will become part of this big idea of a woodland that stretches out and just connects right across the country. Now, this exhibit actually is showing much more than just trees and woodland because it also focuses on the way that our grass is managed. And there are these sculptural round bales which represent hay. And hay is brilliant for encouraging insects, for ground breeding birds. And with farming now, we make silage and that, that's cut. So again, it goes back to the gardener. Long grass, grow grass like hay. Let it grow throughout spring. You can put bulbs into it, you can put wild flowers. Cut it in June or July and then clear it away. And that is a wonderful way of introducing wildlife into the garden. You can even grow long grass around trees, you can underplant. So what I really like about this display, it's tackling very big subjects. Woodland, hay, you know, the, the whole way that we're running our ecosystem, but bringing it back to the garden. We can do this, doesn't matter how small your garden is, you can find a tree that will grow really well. Now trees aren't just a vital element in the battle against climate change. Uh, they can sustain us and we can sustain them too. And the important thing is how we make our planting choices. And earlier today, Nick Bailey met up with Arit on her Garden of Hope to understand the principles behind creating a food forest. Uh, 
a rip. I love the atmosphere, the vibe that you've got going on in the garden here. It's truly beautiful, but there's so many more levels and layers to what you're doing, right? Yeah, there is actually, Nick. I wanted the garden to be based on an edible forest because it would have been too easy just to have given a highly floriferous garden. And the thing with an edible forest, it's about taking the different layers um, of the garden and, and taking a look at those plants you use. So there's the tree canopy that can provide shade for certain plants, you then come down into the sort of like small tree and cat and shrub layer, things like the smaller malus and the apples that are here as well, and all the way down to ground cover and, and vines. So it's, it's using all the different layers within the garden and making sure you're providing benefit for the garden. So, I mean, in essence, it's, it's about permaculture, I suppose, isn't it? It's about that, that balance and the ecology, and I mean, hopefully that's the way all, all gardens are, are heading. And of course, a large component of that is supporting wildlife and insects. And I notice over there, you've got Achillea growing, which of course is brilliant for bringing in parasitoid wasps. They then take out the aphids. So it's about that balance, right? Definitely. I think, you know, our gardens need to have that way of being able to look after themselves. And in this garden, I wanted the garden to be able to, to do exactly that by bringing in all of the beneficial um, pollinators and insects but also as well to feed us you know so there's there's food feed the soul, feed the soul and feed um, elements with us in there as well so I mean things like there's an early Agnes embolata and that's a nitrogen fixer and, and that's one of many different plants that fixes nitrogen in the soil and um, that then feeds the, the soil itself so when you've got fruit trees or, or other be or berries in the garden it's going to feed the soil and you know even things like comfrey does that so um, that's what I'm trying to kind of in encourage people to do. It's all about that balance and that mix of plants and animals and I noticed you've even got fungi growing down here. Yeah, I just thought that would be really fun because, um, you know, these, these ones are in small bags that, that you could grow with, a, you know, with your children even. Um, and again, you know, once these uh, bags are finished, you can sprinkle the substrate in the soil and then you'll get fun uh, fungus mushrooms coming up. So these are oyster and shiitake. What's better than that on a you know, piece of toast? <laughs> and I guess looking around, there's things that the people at first glance would probably think is just an ornamental plant. Yeah. But actually, I mean, for example, your, your dahlias back there are more than ornamental, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, they, they come from Mexico and they actually eat the tubers. I don't think they're apparently the most tastiest of foods, but that they do eat the tuber. And actually, the um, flowers, or, or sorry, the petals on most of the flowers, you can actually sprinkle in a salad as well. You know, wow. so it's just, I think it's just getting people to think beyond, um, just beyond the flowers, dotting in potatoes in here. I've got strawberries, mint, rosemary. It's actually quite a gourmet dish that you could get from this garden. So you get to enjoy the, the you know, the beauty of the, the space, that sort of dynamic of the permaculture and all the sort of layers hanging together. And you can walk out into your own back garden and, and harvest food. Yeah, that's exactly what you want. Thank but, you, Nick. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, there are plenty of choices we make when it comes to planting, including, of course, those that benefit our wildlife. And I'm here at the Landform Balcony with Nicola Hale, who's designed it. Nicola, it's a great balcony. It's Thank got you. It's got everything. It's got seating, a water feature, loads of planting. Mm -hmm. But the key message here is it's for pollinators, isn't it? Yes, it is, yeah. So we've tried to include lots of plants, lots of perennials for pollinators, um, and a shrub for pollinators as well. Oh, um, let's let's talk about that shrub. Yeah, what the most talked about shrub in the, in Chelsea this year. Yeah, well, a few gardens have got it. Yeah, it's been um, a lot of people have asked a lot of questions about it to the point at which we've actually put a little tag on it <laughs> just so that people can take a picture, so they can take it home. So do you don't have to keep telling everyone. Yes, exactly. It's a heptacodium. Yeah. Heptacodium mechanoides. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it's, and got, it's got bees on it, it as well. Has, yeah, it's uh, been attracting them all week. I think it's going to flower all week, so it's perfect. It, perfectly timed, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> it looks like a lovely high multi-stem plant and an yeah. interesting bark too. Yeah. I've got my eye on that. But the, uh, the planting in general is really bringing in the bees, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it is. From the early morning, as it warms up, particularly the helianthus, the coreopsis um, and the salvias, they're just, they're loving it. And, and particularly, actually, the agastache here. Yeah. Yeah. I now, these great. balconies are at ground level, obviously, yes. hence I can talk to you like yes. this. But if they were up in the sky, would these pollinators still find them? Some of them would. They only fly so high, I think, but it's definitely worth trying to include something because you get all sorts of insects, the hoverflies, not just the bees, yeah. um, to, to seek out their pollen and seek out their nectar, I suppose. So. They'll go to great lengths, I think. It's quite sweet that some can only fly so high. Yeah. And what about colours? Do, 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 do some bees go for certain colours? Yes, so, yeah. So we did a little bit of research into it and we found that primarily the purples and the yellows were the, the best attractors 
for the pollinators. Particularly solitary bees, bumblebees, honeybees, they tend to go for these sorts of colour plants more than others. Yeah, well, I go for these colour plants as well. They work <laughs> really nicely. Yeah. I think it's a great little balcony. It's got everything. I can see you've got secretaires imagining gardening out here yeah. in such a tiny Ooh. space. It's an inspiration. <laughs> oh, careful, there's a bee. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Lovely to meet you, Nicola. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Now, with autumn in the air, it's a timely reminder to choose plants that benefit wildlife over the coming cold months ahead. So we sent Juliet Sargent to find some of the best ideas to help our animal friends. With autumn and winter approaching, things can often get a bit harder for the wildlife in our gardens. They often need to fatten themselves up. And so with a little bit of thought, we can make things easier for them. this garden is a little bit untidy. This soft shagginess is so lovely for us to enjoy, but it's really good for the wildlife as well. Just look at this corner of the garden, tucked away. It's almost as if it's been forgotten, but that's exactly what the wildlife need. Somewhere where they can forage for nesting materials, a native hedge like this is just perfect for the little animals to be able to run through as a safe wildlife corridor. The birds can collect the seed heads and also during the winter months they'll eat lovely fresh berries like these on this native hawthorn tree. It's absolutely perfect spot for them. Of course as a garden designer, I love a design detail. And these charred logs are very Chelsea. But there is a serious point to them as well. If you have log piles like this in your garden, then the wood lice, the beetles and creepy crawlies can inhabit all the nooks and crannies. And there is a rumour around the show that there is a lizard somewhere in these log piles, but I haven't seen him yet. We can't all have a spectacular water feature like this, but if you can find space for a small pool or even a bird bath, then that'll provide the essential water that birds and insects and mammals need over the winter months. But the problem is that in the winter, the surface of the water can freeze over. So if you just get hold of a tennis ball and pop it in the water, it'll bob about and that'll stop the water freezing over. Now, traditionally, gardeners have always thought that the best thing to do is tidy up the garden at the end of the summer. But now we know that the wildlife rely on us to be a little bit messier in our gardens. In fact, a messy gardener is a kinder gardener. Well, it might seem like we've covered quite a lot of ground already, but I can assure you there's still plenty to come here at the RHS Chelsea Flower Show and have been supported by M&G. Adam Frost is here with his third Take Three to show us how we can all incorporate sustainable ideas when planning or updating our garden designs. And we explore the world of floristry at the show to discover why looking closer to home when choosing the flowers we buy could have far-reaching benefits for the whole world. We've spent a lot of time talking about gardens this evening, but don't worry, even if you've got no outside space at all, you've probably got plants indoors, and now it's their turn. Earlier in the summer, we met up with Chelsea first-timers Jacob James and Otto Mercer from Grow Tropicals, whose sustainable ethos could make us all think twice before we pick up our next pot plant. We've all realised over the last year and a half that we've spent a lot of time in our houses and I think having plants and something to kind of nurture and care for is really good for your mental health. My name's Jacob James and this is my first ever display at Chelsea Flower Show. I've been collecting tropical house plants seriously for probably about two and a half years. I started to see them as kind of an experiment, so oh, I wonder if I could grow this plant or this plant, or I wonder what happened if I increase the humidity with these plants, and then suddenly it became a, a big wormhole where the whole flat was full of plants. 
What kind of marks someone as a collector is probably someone who, who wants to go beyond just picking up a plant off, off the shelf in a store and, and buying it because it looks nice. For myself, it was, you know, researching the, the habitats of where these plants live, customizing maybe the soil that they're in or the light requirements, and then also just trying to find kind of rarer, and more unusual species, maybe some that, you know, nobody else has in, in the UK. The highlight of my collection at home is this Monstera. The reason I, I love it so much is not just the, the sheer size and kind of the impact that, that it has in a room, but also the, the story behind the plant. I actually got this from a guy who, whose wife had, had sadly passed away. And the, the plant was actually a gift to her from her father when she was 18. Um, so it was almost 50 years of age at the point where I, where I got it. I think it just highlights that the plants can, can have a history and can be part of your life. I started to import plants for kind of my own collection to get plants that I just couldn't find in the UK. And just to kind of cover the costs, I added a few more to the order so I could sell to kind of other collectors. And the first one I did kind of sold out, the second one I did sold out. So I just kept doing it. And then suddenly it got to the point where I was like, okay, I need to take this seriously. It's now like a full-time job. I've got like a thousand plants to, to look after. So I was really looking for a, a partner and that's when I, I met Otto and, and we both had the same interest in, in rare plants and we kind of came together and decided to, to really grow the business. Our reputation is built on our sustainability. It became very apparent during Covid that a lot of plants were being stripped from the wild for profit and we wanted to reduce our impact within the UK as much as possible. So we started growing a large percentage of our plants from seed or from cuttings that we, we take from our mother plants. And our aim is to hit 70% by the end of 2021 of all our plants coming from our own propagations. When we decided to apply for Chelsea, it wasn't so much of a kind of serious idea. We thought that, you know, there's no chance that in our first year that we'd be able to exhibit and they said they loved our idea. It was, it was, a, it was a surprise, let's put it that way. So this display is a 1.2 metre cube that will have glass sides and, and the top. And it's essentially a recreation of a, a slice of the Amazon rainforest. So this is at least four times the volume of the biggest terrarium that most people will have in their home. We have a, a Warakwianum, which some people like to grow as a house plant, but we're showing how it would naturally grow in its native environment. We've got a, a water feature in here, and, and what I was essentially trying to replicate was uh, sort of a, a stream running through a, a rainforest, and you've got maybe a, a huge ramp mound of rock and a few epiphytes growing off of it, and we'll have mosses and aquatic plants growing in the water. It's pretty heavy with all the rock work, the glass. It's around about one tonne. We're really excited to show people exactly what you can do in, in the confines of a small home. I'm really excited. I think it's, it's suddenly pulling the, the whole design together. Yeah, and I'm just excited to, to hear other people's opinions as well at Chelsea. And here we are on Jacob and Otto's stand. And wow, I mean, it's been a bit of a whirlwind for you. I mean, you, you created the business in lockdown and a few months later you're at Chelsea. Exactly, yeah. I mean, Jacob started this essentially as a bedroom business yeah. back in April 2020. Yeah. But it really kicked off when I joined and we built a greenhouse inside a unit and uh, joined our collections together. And that's when we really started. It looks stunning. I yeah. love the way you set it up, like a, a sort of piece in an art gallery. It's so well Thank lit you. as Thank well. You. Yeah, I mean, well, that, that was the intention. It was just really to create a naturalistic un, you know, view of what we, you would get in the rainforest, yeah. but really light it in a dramatic way that really draws the, draws yeah, the attention. Yeah, and you can walk all the way around it, which is great. Yeah. Now, has the response been positive? I guess it has. Yeah, the response has been amazing. I think people are used to seeing small terrariums, but this is like maybe the first time they've seen something on this scale. Yeah. And just really showing what's possible yeah. within a terrarium. And you've got some pretty rare plants in here, haven't you? Yeah, so I think probably all but two of them. It's probably the first time that they've even been at Chelsea. Um, and only a handful of people, even in Europe, grow them. Yeah. Um, 
plants like Anthurium clydemoides, um, Monstera obliqua, um, incredibly sought after and really hard to source. Okay, because I mean, yeah, poaching in the wild, most of us, you know, go and buy a house plant, we don't really know where it comes from. But you guys do know where it comes from and how important it is to, to source them properly. Exactly. Well, I mean, with, especially with COVID, people buying houseplants, the demand has gone way up. So even plants that are quite common in cultivation have started to become poached in the wild. So we make sure we have a full trail of where we're getting plants from, from when we're, from when we're importing. But we, uh, we propagate 70% of our plants in our, in our nursery in the UK. So yeah. we can be certain that that's sort of helping at least. It's really important and I mean it's a beautiful, it, it's great. I just hope the business takes off and you, and you guys do really well. You've got a silver medal, congratulations. Thank you very much. And I'll see you again in spring, right yes, here. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks. Cheers. This exhibit by Sparsholt College is dedicated to the great naturalist Gilbert White. In fact, he was born 301 years ago. And he lived not far from where I was brought up, uh, in the village of Selborne. And his book, The Natural History of Selborne, has still had huge impact. In fact, influences people today. Because the point about Gilbert White was that he observed the natural world in great detail, but from his garden. The lesson he gave all of us was that you don't need to travel to understand huge amounts about the world about you. And as gardeners, if we use Gilbert White's example to meticulously observe what's going on around us, then not only can we benefit from it, but actually we can learn a lot that we can share with other people too. Gilbert White brilliantly observed what was going on in his garden. But what this section of the COP26 garden, which is called mitigation, shows us is not only must we observe, but we can act. We can do things to mitigate the effects of climate change and actually make things better. Now, there's a whole mass of things here, and it's worth going through them. First of all, know your soil. Is it chalk? Is it heavy clay? It will influence what you grow. And if you grow things that want to be there, they're going to be healthy and really look at your soil structure, which is so important. So make lots of compost. Compost will improve the structure of the soil and the life of the soil, and everything gets better as a result. Now, what we have at the back here is a swale. A swale is a lovely word, but really it essentially means a ditch. So water, which is increasingly becoming a problem with these huge downpours we're having, instead of just being taken away to somewhere else, is actually slowed down and can be absorbed if you plant in it. And there are lots of plants that really love that rich, intense environment of wetness, or even a bog, and then it will fade away and they'll be fine. Make a pond, plant it up on the outside so you have lots of diversity. And if you've got paving, leave gaps so the water can get out and plant them up. They look lovely. And finally, lots and lots of pollinating plants. Nice open shapes daisy shapes, the rebecchias, the echinaceas, that can easily be accessible for pollinating insects. And if you put all this together, you don't just have a lovely garden, you are taking an active role in dealing with this crisis that we have to confront. And if we all do a little, then we can all achieve a lot. Mm, he knows his stuff, that Monty, doesn't he? He's got all the ideas. Now to our nightly look at some of the take-home design ideas Chelsea has to offer. In his third Take 3, Adam's looking for ways to reduce, reuse and recycle when creating your dream garden. Right, tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of being on one garden, we're going to go on three gardens and hopefully give you a little bit that maybe you could do in your own garden at home. And this is a prime example, you know. These are literally commercial liquid storage containers, but I've never seen them used in a creative way like this. And you know, design-wise, it would have been really obvious just to put three in exactly the same size. But by reducing this one, it starts to actually bounce them about 
and it makes the whole thing feel a little bit more dynamic. They would be really easy to do. Just drill the bottom so you get good drainage, a little bit of crock, gravel on top of that, soil, compost mix. So actually with three containers, this garden now feels like a woodland and it's in a really small space. But the thing that I really love is right down there in front of you. It's a water feature. You put something like that in your back garden and the quantity of wildlife that arrives. Wow. Right, on to the next one. That was my knee. Hey, it's an age thing, isn't it? These, they're engaging, they're exquisite. They started life as a fallen tree trunk and somebody has carved that and made it into a wonderful container. It's then been burnt, which gives you that lovely sort of dark finish and then sandblasted. You can see over there and it starts to bring out the texture. Set the scene, all right? You've got an area at home it's shady, it's dry, it's underneath trees. But if you build a way with all these little sort of logs and just create tiny little mini raised beds, all of a sudden you can bring another 250, 300 mil of soil and you can plant it and then you can repeat it through the space. So you're gaining more soil depth to plant into. Number three, really simple, is this screen. Ultimately, that's galvanised metal sheeting. You see it on top of agricultural buildings by the seaside, fishermen's hut. It's been repurposed, brought back to life and sprayed a completely different colour. But I like the fact as well it doesn't sit in isolation. I think that's, again, when you're designing and you're creating, you know, especially with reclaimed things, not to use them just in one place, maybe to repeat them. Here, you know, it picks up in the containers and the pools and that gives the whole thing a cohesion. And guess what? That's recycled as well, made out of old bottles. And it's comfortable. Good night. My guest tonight is a former journalist. He's famous as a political strategist, author of 17 books. Uh, a respected broadcaster, and in more recent years, he's become a champion and activist for mental health. And he's also a keen advocate of the healing powers of trees. So, <laughs> Alistair, that's quite a handful. Let's start with the trees. Why trees? Um, I've always been aware of how much I love trees, but it's only in the last two or three years that it's become like almost an obsession. Um, and I think it's because the whole climate debate, people are becoming more aware of their, their role in keeping the world going. But I also think that certainly the older I've got, the more benefit I feel, you talk about mental health, I feel mentally and psychologically, just from being aware of them, looking at them, liking them, being with them, and appreciating what they do for us. Is it because they're, they're sort of, they're big? And they're visible? No, because I, there are some wonderfully small trees that I love. Right. So I, 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 do a, I do a tree of the day on social media right. every day, and I've just spotted the one I'm picking today, and it's quite small. And right. I, I spotted it just through there. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a U. And oh, the, the, the that cone, one, yeah. Yeah, so that's not that big. No, but... but well, uh, the price things... tag is big. Yeah. Ten grand for a tree. Um, so, no, listen, the, when they're massive, yeah. and when you, like, walk in the middle of the Black Forest, and you're just surrounded by these, in, this just the enormity of it, then, yeah, that, that is part of the appeal. And there's a beauty and a majesty to them that I think is incredibly powerful. But also, whenever I'm now on a bit of a dip, mm. and I know you know about mm. dips as well, I do feel that if, I'm, if I need to be on my own, I'm actually not on my own, because I go out and about and... Tree. <laughs> with trees. Have yeah. you, do you plant trees? No, I'm a very, I'm a very impractical person. So I, uh, I should, but well, when you say I don't plant trees, I, I, I can, I order the planting of trees. But I've, I'm, I'm very right. impractical with the earth. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a visceral, emotional response. Totally. Yeah, and that's why I love it, and that's also why, 
when I, when I post my pictures, I get regularly people complaining, why don't you tell us what sort of tree it is? Yeah. And I say, well, often because I don't know. Yeah. And I don't want to be... You're an expert. I don't want to be an expert. I want to keep the ability to have that wow as opposed to, oh, yeah, that's a blah de blah de blah so, so do you find walking around Chelsea slightly intimidating? I mean, I know people do. I don't mean that in any way a personal thing. But because there's so many names and so much expertise that it takes away that, that no, immediate response. No, I don't find response. that. I find, what I find difficult at Chelsea is the ability to, to bathe in it in the mm. way that you can if there's... Because, I mean, look, we're surrounded mm. by people. Mm. Um, so, no, I, what I'm amazed at, Chelsea, is just the sheer logistical prowess of the whole thing, to be yeah. absolutely honest. Do you think that if we systematically plant trees designed to help mental health, that where, you know, where there aren't trees, where, so everybody has access, that they would tap into that same thing that you are? Well, I think we should... I, I certainly think that things like, you know, how to keep a garden looking now, it's the importance of trees. I think they should be taught in schools. I think we should all be taught that. And... Yeah, I do. I, I think that if you, it's like a home without books, and yeah. you know, a, a, a world without trees. I mean, the, those two things for me are what kind of keep this bit going reasonably well most of the time. Some of the time, I fall right. off the edge, but yeah, I, th I think I've certainly. I grew up. My dad was a vet, and so I, I spent a lot of time going around looking at nice scenery in Yorkshire where I was growing up. I've always had it. But it's only latterly that I've I've realised just how important it is. Thanks very much for talking Thank to you. us. Thank you. Now, if you want to see world-class floristry, come to Chelsea. As well as creating arresting displays, many of the exhibitors incorporate new and sustainable practices into their designs, like Lois Golding. She's determined to fly the flag for British Cut Flowers on her Chelsea debut. Hi, I'm Lois. I'm the florist behind Little Garden Flowers, based in Warwickshire. We have a real mixture of clients. We sell flowers in local shops, but we have other people that want really ambitious wedding displays and uh, much more luxurious designs. So we try and cater to everyone and, yeah, do a bit of everything. We grow on quite a small scale. We have tulips and dahlias, other bulbs, and then some annual cutting beds as well. We just try and fit in as much colour and interest as we can, so we have a nice variety of flowers. I've always visited lots of RHS shows, Chelsea being obviously one of the most prestigious, so to actually be able to say I'm exhibiting is quite surreal because this is very new territory for us. Never really done anything like this before and yeah well, there's been some pretty prestigious names in the floristry world that have previously done things like this so yeah it's really quite an honour to be one of those. I think we're one of seven others. It's quite exciting. The design's called Keepers of the Land. Here's a little miniature. We have uh, obviously the three different sections so playing with representation in each of three very different spaces. Um, so at the back, in this section here, it's supposed to represent a woodland. In the middle we have a wild meadow, and then the front section is uh, a representation of like a cultivated space, so either a garden or a flower farm. It's a huge space. <laughs> uh, three by three metres square is a lot of space to fill. Everything's viewed through these sort of circular cutouts uh, with some mirrors sort of bouncing the light around at the back, which is supposed to create a bit of a sort of infinite view, especially when you're sort of stood here looking right to the back. The woodland, the wild meadow and the garden are all represented in my design aim to be put on a platform which they can share together and remind us how they all work on the same cycle. The concept behind the design is a opportunity to look at three different outdoor spaces and analyse and see what roles we can play in their conservation. Small things that we can do to make a difference can be as simple as letting your lawn grow long, making sure that you don't tarmac your front garden, or just planting some bee-friendly wildflower mix. I've always been an environmentalist since probably about the age of 13. So when I set up my business, 
uh, in 2017, I decided that it was really important that those environmental choices were at the heart of what it is that I do. 90% of flowers bought in the UK come from Holland and many are grown even further afield from places such as Ecuador, Kenya and Israel. The carbon footprint of one flower stem can be as high as three kilograms of CO2. That's the equivalent of nearly 15 plastic carrier bags. If we buy British grown blooms, they are not only sustainable, but they are often better quality, stronger smelling and grown by small independent business owners like me. The majority of the time I'm using British grown flowers, I always use foam free methods. Floral foam is the floristry equivalent of asbestos. It contains a complex combination of microplastics which do not biodegrade. Once soaked, it's flushed into our water system, which poisons marine life. As an alternative, I just keep it old school. Moss, compostable bags and twigs works just as well. Being at Chelsea is an honour. It's really special, it's exciting and a great place to show what we can create. It's a great opportunity, um, not only for people who are visiting, but also for people at home, learning about these issues of things that we need to start to change within the industry. So being able to have a platform to highlight the concept and, and talk about the story, as well as, you know, really dive into detail about the specific things we can all do to make things better is, is really, really great. The fact that we get to do that as well as exhibit at Chelsea Flower Show, it's, yeah, pretty cool. <laughs>it's so nice to meet you and to see your passion for British flowers here at Chelsea. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Keepers of the Land did start as a cardboard box <laughs> and now here it is. Are you happy with how it's translated? <laughs> I'm thrilled. It's so bizarre after so long looking at that little box and now we've actually got it in life size. It's, um, yeah, but I mean it really couldn't have translated better. Now, what have you managed to cram into this wonderful bouquet? So we've got um, a real mixture of proper September flowers. All of these cut flowers have come from my closest local farm, uh, which is in Oxfordshire. We've got the Achillea, which is really lovely and bright, vibrant. We've got dahlias in every single color and variety. And then the biggest crowd pleaser is probably the Mexican sunflower. I've had so many people who've commented on it. Yeah, he's been a real star of the show. <laughs> Did you plan this for this time of year? Or was you going to be here earlier in May? Yeah, so it has had to change a little bit from the original plans. Um, it was planned for May, so we kind of had to freestyle a little bit. We decided to embrace the autumnal bold colours. <laughs> but it looks great, and I think actually the switch really, really works. Now, I know that you're really passionate about sustainability. Yeah, you know, people don't realise, do they, just how much flowers can get flown around the world? It wasn't really until I got into floristry that I realised just what this crazy beast is, the global flower industry. You know, flowers are flown from abroad all the time and then they're shipped around the world. 90% of the flowers we buy in the UK are imported. It's really about just spreading a bit of awareness and making people um, aware of what we can get. You know, we don't need to be buying roses from abroad all the time when we have this much choice here in the UK. Yeah, I mean, it looks wonderful. And I think the thing is, is that the great thing about Chelsea is that not only can you tell a message, you can get a medal <laughs> and you've got a silver for your first time. I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, how do you feel about that? It's incredible. I mean, the whole experience has been really quite surreal and, you know, so much thought has gone into really projecting the message behind the piece and using this as a platform to talk about important topics. And I almost forgot that we were going to be judged. So it's, um, it's yeah, to then actually get a, a, a silver medal is, um, yeah, pretty incredible for a first time. Well, good for you. And are you going to be back? That's the big question. We'll see. I might be able to make it happen in May if we're lucky. Never say never. That's what I say. Well, good to see you. Thank you. We've talked a lot about sustainability and it's a big, complicated subject and, and it's never that straightforward, but little things like these cut flowers. If you have cut flowers that are locally sourced and are seasonal, it's not just doing good, it is good, it's beautiful, it's lovely. To totally agree, I mean, Valentine's Day, roses are flown all the way yeah. around the world, it's crazy. Daffodils for, for, yeah. for, for Mrs Swift. Yeah, and a box of chocolates, yeah, of course, okay. don't forget those. 
Now you've still got time to vote for your winner in the BBC RHS People's Choice Award. If you'd like to vote for your favourite garden or still haven't quite made up your mind, here's a little reminder. The Bodmin Jail, 60 degrees east, a garden between continents by the designers Ekaterina Zazukhina and Carly Kershaw. The Trail Finder's 50th anniversary garden by designer Jonathan Snow. Organic Garden by designer Tom Massey, supported by Sarah Mead. The Florence Nightingale Garden by designer Robert Myers. The M&G Garden by designers Charlotte Harris and Hugo Bug. To vote for your favourite, just head to the website bbc.co.uk forward slash Chelsea and you'll find details on all six gardens plus the terms and privacy notice. The vote closes at 10 o'clock tonight and please don't try and vote if you're watching on demand. Now we have just enough time for a few of your questions. Here we go, Monty, quick fire. Stuart Baines asks, best bulbs for a hot, dry border? Well, at this time of year, um, I really like nerines and amarines. Yeah, love beautiful in the summer. I love foxtail lilies. They yeah. love to be baked in a hot dryer. And, and spring spring bulbs, most spring bulbs like a hot baked border. The only thing is, is not uh, snowdrops, aconites, or fruiteries. They yeah. need actually quite a lot of damp. Yeah, from. yeah, and shade they yeah. prefer too. Yeah. Okay, Claire Lees asks, can I plant a tree fern in a pot in a north-facing planter in central London, London, or does it need to be in the ground and with sun? Well, certainly not sun. Tree ferns like shade, and of course it can be in a pot, yeah? Yeah, in fact, it's fine in a pot because it doesn't put it out feeding no. roots, so yeah. you water into the Absolutely. crown, and that's where it takes yeah. its moisture in. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, Maddie from Bath asks, we love the artisan gardens when they are beautiful recreations. If you were to design an artisan garden, what scene would you recreate? Go on, you start. Fisherman's hut. Got to be, I've got, you know, I've got, it's a bit Derek Jarman with the planting and then my fishing rods would be up there and my waders hanging in the corner. Can you see it? Yes, I can, right. Well, I would, I'd go onto dry land. I would have a hurdle maker in hazel coppice, fire, little charcoal fire, the dog lying there, my sandwiches and a thermos in a bag. <laughs> Bill Hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing about the judging, you can overdo it. You're not heading for a gold then, obviously. <laughs> well, don't forget, you can send us your questions via Twitter at GW and Shows using the hashtag Ask Monty and Joe or via our Facebook page. And that's it for this evening. Don't forget to join Nikki and Angelica on BBC One tomorrow afternoon at 3.45. And you can join Sophie and I on BBC One at 7.30 when we announce your winner of the BBC RHS People's Choice Award 2021. And then we will both be back here at the slightly later time of 8.30 when we're going to be joined by the singer Charlene Spiteri as she gives us an exclusive look around her amazing garden. So, good night. Good night.